a tale of two Stuart S50 steam engines, part two. In this one, I'm continuing the dismantling of the factory machine kit and putting all of the parts removed in a plastic box. Now I can see just how worn the main bearings are. After this, I can move on to disassemble the other one. I do like the word disassemble. It reminds me of a film I saw many years ago called Short Circuit. Never mind that, I have more important things to do. Here, I'm removing the eccentric rod from the valve rod. This first of all entails removing the lock nut, followed by the parallel shank bolt that holds it all together. And here's the story so far. This is the valve rod sticking out of the valve chest. And inside the valve chest is a slide valve operated by this rod. The slide valve slides over the ports. This admits and exhausts the steam. And to make this happen, it has to be moved back and forth. And it's this part that does the moving. This is the eccentric, or should have been more specific and say, the eccentric sheave with the eccentric strap around the outside. One thing I noticed, which is a nice touch, is if you look at the hole through the eccentric sheave, the outer edge of it is chamfered, which makes it much easier to slide onto the crankshaft. And while on the subject of crankshafts, once again, here is a close-up showing the damage to the crankshaft caused by the grub screw that secures the flywheel to the shaft. I mentioned this in the last episode, and I'm going to mention it again. Damage to the crankshaft like this makes it very difficult to withdraw from both the flywheel and the eccentric. And it's really important to remove this damage before sliding the crankshaft into some new main bearing inserts. In this clip, using a small screwdriver that I once got out of a Christmas cracker, I'm removing the small bolts that hold the cladding onto the cylinder. This is a surprisingly good little screwdriver. It even works if you don't have it positioned in the slot properly. With the last of the brass dome head machine screws removed, before I can progress any further, I need to remove the exhaust pipe. The exhaust pipe is threaded into the cylinder, so I'm just unscrewing it. This anodized cover has been damaged when the engine was assembled. The original exhaust adapter was fitted to the engine using a very large fibre washer, which distorted the shape of this piece of cladding. The top of it has been squashed by the fibre washer, and you can see that more easily in this clip. This soft, anodized aluminium cladding has been distorted by the pressure of the washer, and if I can't remove the distortion, then I'll buy a new piece of aluminium cladding from Stuart Models and cut it to shape to bend around the cylinder. Here I'm giving the exhaust outlet a bit of a clean and scraping away masses of sealant. Thankfully, it's not silicone sealant. And once again, this is taken care of by my Christmas cracker screwdriver. Here is a shot of the incredibly worn, well, shot main bearings. I'll be taking this part into the main workshop to enlarge the holes to fit bushes. And once again, I showed my idea for the bushes in the previous episode. I've already worked on this engine in a previous series. I'm going to take off the cylinder cover to show what's inside. After removing all of the bolts at four times normal speed, after I take the cover off, you can see the piston inside the cylinder. After slackening the lock nut that secured the piston rod into the crosshead, I was able to unscrew the piston. And yes, I do realise that the screwdriver is a bit on the small side, but nevertheless, it does remove the piston. And now the piston's gone. You can clearly see in this clip that the cylinder is made from cast iron, the steam chest is made from gun metal, and the cylinder cover is made from cast iron. This is not the same as the other S50, where every part of the cylinder, steam chest, and cover are all made from gun metal. Originally, the piston was worn and now it's not a particularly tight fit in the cylinder, but because it's using an O-ring, it doesn't want to be a tight fit in the cylinder. This is a clip from a previous series showing me fitting the piston ring. A word about Stuart pistons for engines of this size. This is what they normally look like. It's just a gunmetal piston with oil grooves. This is fine when you first build the engine, but after running for quite a while, the thing wears out. And the solution is either to make a complete new piston or machine the existing one to take an O-ring. And the good news is, the diameter of a piston designed to use an O-ring needs to be slightly smaller than the diameter of the cylinder. Here I'm trying the O-ring in the groove to see if it's the right size. 
and it would appear that this is fine. To finish the job, I'm using a needle file to remove any sharp edges. The next part of the job is to remove the piston and rod from the chuck, clean up the piston to remove any swarf, apply plenty of oil to the piston groove, preferably steam oil, and then insert the piston into the cylinder. Please note it should not be a tight fit. If it is a tight fit, the O-ring will prematurely wear out. After a fit of the piston ring, I've timed the engine to perfection. But what's this? The flywheel isn't wobbling about. Even though the crankshaft is incredibly worn, if you spend a bit of time messing with the timing, you can actually get the thing to run in balance. But alas, this is not the way to do it. On this engine, the crankshaft is not particularly worn, but the main bearings, which are cast iron and actually cast into the main casting of the engine's bed anyway, are really badly worn and far bigger than they should be. I'll put this right very shortly in a future episode, and you may be interested to see how I do it. How did I make the timing of this engine so perfect that the crankshaft didn't wobble about? Here's the answer. In this clip, I'm showing whereabouts in the stroke the air is being admitted, and it's just before top dead centre. This cushions the reciprocating masses of the engine, and therefore it runs much more smoothly. It's simple when you know how, but it does take a bit of practice. On a Stuart S50, the cylinder is held to the main casting with just three bolts. And normally when I check these bolts on an S50, I find them to be loose, but not so on this model. These were extremely tight, and you know what they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They are so tight, I would probably shear them off trying to get them out. I'm going to leave the cylinder attached to the bed casting because it will not get in the way of the bearing bushing job that I'm about to do. I think I'll probably put this engine in my ultrasonic cleaner, but just to give it a chance, I'm doing some light degreasing using a kitchen towel. That's it for this episode. After a thorough clean, I'll do the bearing job, but I will need to take it up to the main workshop for that. As always, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.